Greetings, 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 everyone. Hello, I'm Grant Williams. I'm the host of The Bird Emergency. And today we've got a special, a special edition of The Bird Emergency, which is doubling as an edition of Plants Grow Here. And we have a very knowledgeable bird nerd, Dr Holly Parsons, here with us. But for those of you who don't know, the Bird Emergency is a show about rare, threatened, critically endangered, and coming up, we're even going to talk about an extinct bird. And it's about introducing you, the viewer, to the amazing programs and the hard work and the research, the people who do all of that work to try and ensure that we don't lose more birds. So that's the whole rationale behind the bird emergency. We're um, 40 episodes in. Episode 41 will be going out shortly after we conclude today's session. My new co-host for today, Dan Fuller, who is the host of Plants Grow Here. How are you, Dan? Thanks for Good, thanks, agreeing Grant. to do this. Tell us about yeah, Plants Grow Here and tell us about you. Sure. So I'm a horticulturist that's been a pro gardener for about nine years. I'm really interested in the science behind how plants work and how everything fits together in the ecology. Basically, our mission statement at Plants Grow Here is that we are into horticulture, ecology and landscape gardening, and we feature industry professionals, experts and enthusiasts just help to teach our listeners about that. And it's good for us to have people from the enthusiast side where they really love it, but they may not um, be a scientific, but they can tell us about practical things. And then it's also great to have on the other scale, like, for example, like PhD scientists and stuff who are going to really take us through the nuts and bolts. So before we get in today, I just wanted to thank three people. I want to thank John Dengate, who wrote an excellent book called Attracting Birds to Your Garden in Australia. I want to thank Ben Sims, who's the other half of Plants Grow Here, who's a basically a native plant nut and who's taught me a lot about native gardening. And also Dr. John Martin from episodes 27 and 28 of our podcast, Plants Grow Here, who works with the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney on a project called Hollows as Homes. And he basically has a bunch of products, including big city birds and yeah, Hollows as Homes is transitioning to become wildlife assist. So those are three people. Also, a lot of people on Twitter who we've been chatting with um, over the weekend have really added a lot. So big shout out to all of our Twitter friends and family. There's too many on there to basically thank. But yeah, cheers, guys. And Dr. Holly Parsons, who is representing BirdLife Australia. Now, let's just be clear, this is not a BirdLife Australia show, so let's just get that clear. But Holly is the manager of the Birds in Backyards program, which is technically called the Urban Birds program. Hello, Holly. Welcome aboard. Hi, Grant. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah, so I run the Urban Bird Program for BirdLife Australia, which basically is all about the birds that live where people live. And so we have a range of projects within that umbrella that we run. The biggest of those is Birds in Backyards. And Birds in Backyards is a website and a project that has been running since, oh, it actually kicked off in 99. So we've been around for quite a while and we're all about sharing spaces with birds, what people can do to contribute to our knowledge of um, how birds are faring in urban spaces and how individuals can take action for birds in their own space to create a better, more balanced habitat. Now, Holly, I might just note for those um, who are joining us live, I can see your eyeballs are on the screen. Thanks very much. If you want to participate, you just need to put a comment in and I will, I'll get to it as soon as it fits what we're talking about. And if you have a particular example or a experience that you would like to share more generally in the birdemergency.com uh, splash page, which is still live, there is a button you can press to join the studio and I can bring you in and we can, you know, get you in your face here and your voice to tell us more particularly, I would really love to know about the urban lyrebird nest that we've been seeing 
on on bird twitter which has been amazing but anything else that comes up we want to answer questions but we do have a bit of a framework we're going to try and walk through and hopefully we cover everything and well i don't think uh, look i don't <laughs> think we can cover everything we're going to be go- we would be going for uh hours and hours and hours and hours but let me just throw back to holly for a minute Holly, Dan mentioned John Dengate, who is an entomologist, I believe, by training, and very familiar to people like me with grey hair. He was he was a mainstay of Burke's Backyard, which at the time was must-see viewing on a Friday night for anyone interested in gardening, talking about wildlife, particularly in gardens and in the places where people interact. But there was a book that predated that, that I was happy that you were familiar with it because it was something that was dear to me when I established um, Wildlife Friendly Gardens. So, Holly, would you like to give that guy a shout-out? Yeah, so that's the George Adams Birdscaping Your Garden book, which, as you said, Grant, was uh, new, the an original edition was in the 80s, I think. Yep, but yep. a few years ago a new edition came out as well. So you can still absolutely get it from a bookstore, order it online. It's chock-a-block with plant suggestions and structural advice and information on the different birds that you might get. It's definitely a a great encyclopedia of knowledge to have. And, George, if your Google alerts ping and you know that we're talking about you, (laughs) when I first started the Bird Emergency, which is a couple of years ago now, I reached out to your publisher and wanted to have a chat with you. But crickets so you're always welcome mate because that was a really influential piece of writing for me so i would love for you to join us when we do something like this at another time uh dan what kind of gardens do you create i'm a maintainer so i don't actually create the gardens so i'm the one who has to come in and maintain gardens whether they've been designed well or whether they've been designed poorly So that's basically where I'm coming from. So I can tell you right now that a lot of garden maintainers out there are not thinking about wildlife. They're not even, they don't even have a good understanding of horticultural practices. They're putting in plants that are the wrong plant at the wrong place a lot of the time for the wrong reasons with the wrong aftercare. And that's not what we want. Plant selection is key. And even though we've all got our own sort of biases, we are not riding any particular hobby horse here. But I would like to start the discussion with what should you do before you put a shovel in the ground, before you grab your secateurs, before you get your marking tape or you run down to Bunnings and buy that pink marking tape to mark out your paving or your barbecue or whatever. There's a couple of things you really need to do just when you're sitting on the couch or having the family discussion about what you want to do. Who wants to tread into this area first? Go for it, Holly. (laughs) Okay, sure. So I guess from there's a couple of things. So coming at it from a bird perspective. No, no, rewind, (laughs) rewind, rewind. Before you do anything, before you do anything, you need to research Research. with your local council. (laughs) You need to find out. Oh, that's a great one, local council. You you, you need to find out what you can do. You need to find out if there are plants that you cannot grow. You need to find out if you can use the nature strip. You need to find out if perhaps you've got a public access right of way. Do you have to make sure that you don't plant something that's going to hang over into it? So you need to get familiar with those kind of rules and you really need to find out if there are things that are growing on your property that you cannot interfere with and things like do you have services like cables, sewers, old drainage lines, things like that you, you need to be aware of. So dial before you dig, talk to your council about what you can grow In most cases, they won't tell you what you can grow, but they'll tell you most definitely what you can't grow. 
And I'm thinking about things like in parts of Melbourne, liquid amber, don't grow it. Bone seed, don't grow it. When you're talking about northern parts of Australia, lantana, agapanthus, all these kind of things that nurseries will still try and sell you, but you are not permitted to grow in certain areas. That's the first thing you should do. Then, and on Holly. that, <laughs> on that, Grant, I find it's a really good idea to go to your local council website because a lot of them will have wildlife information on it. There are some great resources out there on to avoid the ones that, like you said, can become weeds and become issues. There's some great resources that have got suggestions on alternatives that look really similar. But from a bird perspective, before you think, even think about the plants that you wanted to put in or what you wanted to remove, mm. is just to actually observe what's going on. So make a cup of tea or a coffee, sit out in your garden and take notice of what is coming in and using it and where they're using it. So what plants are the birds going for? What ones are they avoiding? Is there a particular thing that's really popular? And if you are able to go out and do a regular walk, take a notice of what's going on in your neighbourhood. You don't need to have binoculars. can look a bit creepy wandering around the street. (laughs) Just word of warning. But you can go out and just take note of what birds are around. So what's catching your eye? Where's the nearest patch of bushland? Where have you got a nice tall strand of trees that could be a nice corridor? And start to put together where your garden sits in the grand scheme of things. Dan, do you want to add something there? I love that, Holly. So, yeah, we want to think like a bird. Like what do birds like? We need to know that. And we're going to learn that in this episode, hopefully. So it's things like, yeah, like Holly said, like what flowers do certain birds go for? And don't just look out for the big birds either. Look out for the little brown ones. Those are really ecologically valuable a lot of the time. Like a lot of those rainbow lorikeets and stuff, yeah, build nest boxes for them them and brush-tie possums. It's great, but they're not as ecologically valuable as some of those other birds, as Dr. John Martin said on our podcast. One of the things about (laughs) birds like rainbow lorikeets is that they – demand your attention. They're active, they're funny, they're interesting, they're social, um, they're beautiful, but they're bullies and they drive out less aggressive and non-dominant species. And when I was young, back when we had stagecoaches and um, (laughs) when, when I was a young person, Rainbow lorikeets were not common in our city, so certainly in Melbourne, where I was familiar with, were not common. I got very excited the first time I saw a long-billed corella in the environs of Melbourne. You used to have to go to the western districts of Victoria to see long-billed corellas. Now, I love them, but you got to understand that when they're coming in, They are displacing something else. And the reason they're coming so far over here to the east of Melbourne, where I am, is that we've driven them out of the places where they want to live, where they like to live, where they really should be. So, yeah, think about the opportunities you're creating for We can't call them bad birds because there's no such thing as a bad bird. (laughs) But there are birds that are just like, Dan, you said pest plants, Holly, you said weed potential. Mm. Something that's in the wrong spot is potentially a pest or a problem. So part of the challenge for any of us who are planting things in the ground is to create opportunities for the things that we want to join us in our our shared environment but to discourage to to keep out if possible with non-invasive and non-interventionist means pest species who wants to take that right take the reins here and charge off yeah i guess i like to call some of those birds you could use hyperabundant They've discovered urban habitats, whether it is because they've intentionally, not intentionally, but because they've been pushed out of their more natural environments or just that we've simply created 
fabulous places for them. So sulfur crested cockatoos, rainbow lorikeets are classic examples of those noisy miners where you've created a similar space to what they would naturally have found in and then you've taken it up a level because you've put in lots of flowering plants or you've put in lots of things that they have just meant that they've been able to explode in number. So we certainly have in us in Australia, particularly along our coastal urban areas, a range of birds that are just doing phenomenally. They're fine. We don't need to put in another bottle brush to keep the rainbow lorikeets happy. They're happy anyway. <laughs> There's plenty of them around. What we need to do is maximise the chances of getting some of these other birds in. And it tends to be, for the most part, the smaller native birds that tend to struggle in urban areas. They were once much more common in parks and gardens than they are now. And there's probably a few reasons for that. We're continuing to urbanise. We're expanding out. We're taking up much more natural habitat. There's less bushland patches or good quality bushland patches for them to be using. Our gardens are getting a lot smaller because we all tend to want bigger houses. The quarter acre block doesn't exist anymore where you could have a whole heap of sprawling things. Those gardens are a rarity. So we've gone to small block uh, small blocks big houses with very little room for the, for a garden and mainstream i think a lot of the garden design that certainly got pushed through the 90s and beyond has been drought tolerant plants and very streamlined yeah. and aesthetically straight yeah, that, and i think that, that that's created a problem as well yeah i i want to really stop there for a second that's been one of the biggest problems when that period you were talking about, Holly, was all the go, Paul Bangay, Jamie Drury, Japanese-style gardens that had nothing to do with Japanese design, I was working for Yates and for Bunnings at different times. And what we were pushing were simplistic, minimalist kind of landscapes, the front yard with a path, with a box hedge or something like that or a row of lamandra or something similar but spaced out so they were easy to maintain that was the big thing but offered no value to birds let alone frogs or lizards or any other form of wildlife so we've moved away from that in in one part of the industry, but the housing industry, and Dan, this is where you see it all the time as a landscape maintenance guy, that segment of our industry, because they all interlock, has not caught up with it and it costs money to maintain habitat and nobody wants to spend any money. That's 100% right, Grant. So, Yes, a lot more knowledge needs to go into landscape design in terms of habitat building and stuff like that. And I think that there's this disconnect there within the industry where different parts of the horticultural industry don't talk to each other. So it's like maintenance gardeners aren't passing on what they know to to architects and to construction crews, vice versa. So I think as a whole, we all really need to be learning from each other and ecologists too. Like We all need to be like seeking out information as much as we can so you're talking about habitat here and you said lamandras are far spaced out. Lamandra is actually a great plant for birds. Absolutely. But not when they're spaced out. When they're close together and the birds can make little tunnels beneath these. So lamandra, for people who don't know, it's like a tufty, grassy type plant. It's not a true grass, but it looks Matt, like a grass. It looks like a comfy grass. Matt Rush. So, Matt Rush. Matt Rush, exactly. And they've got these spiny kind of flower stalks and they've got all spikes on them. Birds love anything spiny, anywhere where they can hide, little tunnels and stuff like that. And then let's say, like, imagine if you had, like, this lamandra really densely planted on the ground. Then you have, say, like a bottle brush or some kind of shrubby bush with a vine growing over that. Now you have these different kinds of flowers. You've got berries parts of the year. And then you've just got these little hidey holes where, you know, little tiny wrens and stuff can hide inside of these little tunnels that are made by the, made by the vines that are growing over the shrub. And it's just, like, really intricate. So it's like... Yes, you could say it's high maintenance, but a lot of that is just left. So it's actually very low maintenance. It's just not pretty. It's just not what we think of as being aesthetically pleasing. Holly, I'd like you to tell us about the next sort of thing I'd put on our running sheet, which was to be able to think about 
layers or levels in your garden. Tell us why that's important. Yeah, I guess the thing is that there are, what, you probably get about 600 different bird species that are known to use, visit towns and cities in Australia. That is a, that's a vast majority of our birds can be found in these urban areas. So we have huge potential to attract a range of different birds. They all have different requirements. There's no one such thing as a bird-friendly garden, um, which is great because it means that it gives us a lot of flexibility to match what we need out of a garden with what the birds need. But you need to provide opportunities for a range of different birds. And so that means layers in particular are really important. So that's adding structure to your garden. Again, I'm going on with what our garden styles tend to be now and what our urban environments tend to be is tall trees, grassy understory. The stuff that's missing is that middle layer from two metres down. It's those vines, it's those shrubs, and that's what a lot of birds really and, like. And, Holly, I, I'll just recount an example that's happened. Regular listeners to my show know that I live ac- directly across the street from, from a park. And when I moved up here, it's basically a playground and a big grassy area and then a fringe of trees with some gardens at the entry points and a few marginal gardens on the extreme of the fences. Now, for a while, there were small honey eaters and thornbills in those areas. But a couple of years ago, and I'm sure it was public safety, as was the consideration here, the council, the Parks and Gardens crew came in and took out all of the undergrowth, the prickly wattles, the all, all that kind of stuff. That's all gone. So now down at one end, we've got this lovely thicket of casuarinas. Actually, I think they're LA casuarinas. And some malalukas and some calistamins, but there's no under understory. Beautifully mulched, but the only birds I ever see in there are pigeons and the magpies. And everywhere else they were taken out. So now the park is only a haven for a couple of pigeons. We've got crested pigeons, we've got the 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 introduced spotted turtle dove, Indian ringneck, whatever you want to call it. Soft-crested cockatoos, there's a family of magpies that ju- guard it jealously. What's the correct name for the yellow-winged or New Holland honey eater these days, Holly? We've got New Holland, a couple of, New Holland honey eater, yeah, that's a, the official name. But We've got a couple of families of those that are in the area. In the tall eucalypts, we've got white-plumed honey eaters and occasionally pardal oats. But there's red and little wattle birds, but there's, n- but that's they're the residents, and then the lorikeets are everywhere, and the corellas visit and dig up the the onion weed. But in doing what the community wanted, public safety, we've destroyed habitat, and it hasn't been replaced anywhere else, and that's the common story. So we need people. We need people. We need your neighbours, my neighbours, Dan's neighbours to start putting some of that stuff in because I don't think that public safety argument, think of all those paths that interconnect city suburbs. Oh, where I live, we've got native trees everywhere. The canopy the, is beautiful, but all of the areas that used to have shrubs have been ripped out. And if we don't put them back in private gardens, those birds will never, ever be back in those suburbs. No, that's because... right. Sorry, go down. You're right. So when we're talking about these layers, these little tiny brown birds, they know their prey. So they want somewhere where they can feel safe. At the bottom of the layer, they can go into a little hidey hole to hide from a bird of prey or something that's above. Then when the cat comes, wants to jump up you know, in, in the middle, then there's a snake in the middle of that bush wants to hop over to another bush or maybe underneath the lamandras. It's just this like really intricate food web that that we're trying to replicate here. And that's also providing food for the birds. So yeah, flowers, berries, fruits, all that stuff's great. 
Also get your lawn right because that's going to have a lot of grubs in there. So mulch mow your lawns, organic fertilizers, leave the dead wood in the trees, leave the dead wood on the ground. If you've got a great big log, leave it there, let it rot down because all of those things are food sources for things that are food sources for things that are food sources for things and so on, basically. I wanted to introduce that idea of birds being food for other birds a bit later, but I think this is a good Sorry. time <laughs> to talk about it. No, well, it, it makes sense. Little birds are food for butcher birds. They're food for hawks. They're food for owls. You might get lucky and have falcons and things like that. Now, what you want to do is make it an even playing field. If you don't have anywhere for little birds to hide, the only winner is going to be the hawk or the falcon or the cat or some other predator. And this is the same for lizards and for uh, frogs, um, native rodents, anything else that might be scurrying around if you've got leaf litter or little, like you said, hidey holes, Dan, rocks. You, all you need to do, if you've got some roofing tiles that are laying around that Uncle Fred had left over from his reno, you just get a a brick and a roofing tile, lean over, it's like a little lean-to that we would call a, a humpy or something, but that's a perfect spot for a lizard, perfect spot for spiders, perfect spot for frogs on a hot day. So make opportunities for them where a bird, a predatory bird, kookaburras, kingfishers. Oh, yeah. So, Dan, <laughs> it's it's hard not to go off on a tangent, especially if you're me, because that's my special skill. Um, but everything's interconnected <laughs> that we're talking about here, Grant. So, yes, the habitat is the food source. So we're not what we're not wanting to do is we're not wanting to go out and hand feed these birds or give them birds and nuts and stuff, uh, give them fruit and nuts and stuff as a substitute for plants have all of that in them and they also provide habitat too. So we're looking to replicate natural looking things which aren't always as pretty as a manicured garden. It might be a vine strangling a head, strangling a bush, and that's just... Hmm going to play out in the long term one of them's going to win one of them's going to lose but in the 50 years that struggle between those two plants is going on there's some incredible habitat there let's just extend out the layers bit for a minute about why it's so important and holly i'll throw it up there that if we had suburbs where every one of our gardens had a big tree and that we all weren't so intent on pruning along a fence line and that you had a big eucalypt that just almost touched into the next eucalypt and the calistamine or the melaleuca or the camellia, what, whatever, the big rhododendron were leaning over and touching another plant, that's a pathway. It's the highway that animals and birds use. Now, we need to really think about having those things in our built environment. What, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Oh, I was going to say, Holly, what have you found out in the, the work that you guys have done and with the, the great Aussie Backyard Bird Count, which is one of those great projects that BirdLife does each year, what have you discovered about what is actually happening because we're all talking anecdotes. What's actually happening in our suburbs with the birds that we are familiar with? So I guess, as I said before, the so the Aussie Backyard Bird Count has been running for, I think, six years now. I think this might be the seventh year this year coming up in October. So that's our once a year census of how birds are going, where we ask anybody to grab an app and go and count birds for 20 minutes and tell us what they've got. Every year, the top birds are noise, rainbow lorikeets and I think magpies are number two. The top 10 list doesn't change a lot. They're the big urban winners. I'll throw into the mix that we also run birds in backyard surveys, which confuses things because there's the app. A bit on the green. So in, a, in conjunction with that once a year count, we also have another survey which is open year round and we tend to promote seasonally where we ask people to record what they've got visiting them 
in terms of the birds, but also what their habitat's like. So we ask people to do a simple little questionnaire which says, my garden is mostly natives, mostly exotics. I have a lot of trees or no trees, a little bit of lawn. I feed birds. I do X, Y, and Z. And so we've been able to take that data and really look at what habitat preferences different birds have. So we find things like New Holland honey eaters, like you mentioned before, fairy wrens, silver eyes. We tend to find them in gardens where the plants are mostly native and where we have more than 50% shrub cover. So they're really going to that nice, dense, thicket type garden. That's where you tend to get them. On the other hand, where that gets a little bit more confusing if you're looking at individual species that you want to attract, fairy wrens, so superb fairy wrens, my favourite bird, really like those gardens, but they also like a lot of open lawn space. Okay, so we need a garden for those birds that's got a lot of lawn and a lot of shrubs because they're coming out and doing their feeding and ducking into the shrubs for protection. Uh, Holly, just excuse me for just a minute. What, uh, I, I think lawn, we can we can interchange that with the term open space. Open space, it, sure. For, foraging areas for small birds. Mm. So it that I just don't want people to think they have to have a lawn because in some instances lawn is the enemy. But we'll, yeah, uh, especially if you're using chemicals. But if, if we're talking yeah. about a lawn that's just grass growing in carbon-rich soil and you've got things like dandelions and stuff in there, this, especially when you have dandelions and uh, clover and stuff like that, because th- these little flowering plants are going to provide even more food sources. So, like birds might eat the leaves or even the seeds or the flowers. They might just, yeah, have a graze on this varied diet rather than just grass because grass doesn't have a whole lot of nutrition other than grains. <laughs> but I think, Dan, that sort of... I think that sort of just highlighted my point is that a lot of people are fanatical about maintaining a lawn with no downy lines, with no clover, with no anything else. Please please start to think about meadows. Now, now, here we go. This is what I like. This is what I like to see. There we are. We've got a comment there. (laughs) Ha, Holly, you've just described my place for fairy wrens. Yes. Perfect. That's great. And do do contribute. We do want to know what is happening in your location and what your experience will certainly help help somebody else. Can I get you, Holly, to perhaps tell us a bit more about the data that has become evident in the bird count? Who are the biggest losers that you've seen over the years? Oh, yeah, look, it... <laughs> Losers is a strong term. I mean, which birds are being replaced? And mm-hmm. because I've, I've got a little anecdote, which I'll share a bit later, but and it might surprise you which birds got me really concerned about where birds are. Okay, look, it, I mean, I guess it depends on the, the threat that, that you can try and reverse. So different birds are, are being threatened by different by different things, but we tend to find the birds that don't do as well in urban areas tend to be smaller natives, generally insect eaters or seed eaters. Some of the smaller honey eaters as well, like your white-cheeked honey eaters, white-plumed honey eaters as well, scarlet honey eaters. Um, white nape is what I've really naped, noticed as yeah. missing in my part of Melbourne. Yep. So it tends to be, if you're doing really well, if you are bigger, more aggressive, more flexible in your diet, you can eat lots of different things, then you've got a a smorgasbord in an urban space. But if you are fussier with your diet, if you tend to be smaller, more cryptic, shyer, then you tend to struggle against some of those bigger, bolder personalities that are taking over urban spaces. And then if you're towing big birds, it can be really hard for a lot of birds of prey. You've got Mm. Butcher birds, currawongs, meat eaters doing okay, but a lot of those bigger birds of prey are actually generally quite sensitive. They don't like human development. They don't like being around people, so they find it really challenging. When you're talking owls, of course, you're looking at loss of hollows. Unfortunately, big old trees tend to be one of the first things to go um, in urban spaces, and we can talk a little bit about that later, I'm sure. But, you know, owls can find it quite challenging a lot of the time. So there's a whole range of ways we make it really difficult for birds to live with us. But there are things that you can do in your own space and it's really about creating that good habitat to bring them back. Dan, I know you'll want to talk about hollows 
that later, and I <laughs> certainly do too. But let's put that aside for a minute. I I want to introduce the idea of what we do with the built environment in our gardens, and that's the hard landscaping that we do, and how it affects birds and wildlife generally. Dan, I think uh, you. I, I hope you read my little notes so that I don't have to say it all all again but can you talk about those common things that we see in all the built environment which is fences paving particularly and then other structures that we utilize sure yeah i'd love to i don't remember the notes because i know we've sent a few notes back and forth so i can't remember the specific notes this time but yeah, look, in nature, you're going to find rocks. It's not that different to a paver. You're going to have little critters growing up, under, uh, little critters rolling around underneath the paver. If you lift that paver up, you'll notice there's little centipedes and all sorts running under there. That's fine. Great place for lizards to sunbathe on. Fences, yeah, it's just like similar things are going to be in nature. It's just about diversifying, isn't it, really? So, like, let's just say you just have a small little courtyard and you don't have that much space. Just pick something to do. Maybe around the side you can have a little vine or a big thick vine growing along that fence and level up that fence in terms of habitat that it's, the, the habitat that it's providing. Maybe you do have a eucalyptus tree and it's giant. There's no other eucalyptus trees around for a couple of hundred metres. Yeah, there's not many corridors, so that's reduced, but at least you can maybe put some hedges around beneath it or something like that just to create those levels. So we're really looking to nature and trying to replicate what she does because she's really clever and she, yeah, she knows everything. So that's who we're trying to copy in the built environment. Holly, do you want to take that up and run with the idea of what paving? Because I take what Dan said, absolutely. I had a slightly more negative connotation on the effects for wildlife, which I'm guessing you might tease out a little bit further. Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, I guess any time you're adding, I guess, a relatively impervious surface, it's not particularly a feature that a lot of birds want to spend a lot of time on. Okay, so yeah, you, Dan's right. It's great for, for lizards and things to bathe on, which your kookaburras and your butcher birds will love. But for the most part, it's not adding a lot of habitat for birds in particular. We tend to find that if you've got more of that sort of blank space, that impervious surface, then you tend to get more of your introduced birds. So you're going to get more of your common or Indian miners, your spotted doves that like hanging around us and our sort of structures that we tend to build. They like being around our guttering and things as well. So definitely minimising it, still having it around. I guess it's around that balance. You, same with open lawn space. You don't want it to dominate your garden you want to have lots of different options in there so you don't have a, a hopefully not a garden that's entirely paved but there might be one corner where you've got your little yeah oh yeah me too well, that, that, well that's really what i where i was heading is that let's think about i i'm not familiar with the suburbs where you live holly but for dan and i in melbourne i'm familiar with the area that dan lives in and apart from the redevelopment where the townhouses have been built where you're getting two two-story residents with a very small backyard have taken over those um, larger backyards what we saw was really common in the in the 80s for people who and the 90s for people who weren't in the native plant fad you would have a big paved area a lovely entertaining area but what happens to an area of hard paving on a 40-degree day? Mm. It radiates heat and it makes your whole area unbearable for small animals, birds and large animals too. But So if you don't have a refuge, dense plantings where they can go and enjoy a 5 to 10-degree cooler place, they're just leaving. And animals are creatures of habit. Uh, like we are, if every hot day they have to escape because it's the only way they can survive, they stop coming back. But not only do we create, well, a large paved area for a small animal is a desert. 
That's all it is. It's a bloody hot desert. But what else it, we do when everybody pays? And this is what's happened in our suburbs. Everybody's got their entertaining area. That rainfall that used to land on grass or on a, a border, herbaceous border or something else, that no longer goes into the soil profile. It runs off, it goes into our stormwater and it ends up in the bay, the river, the what, the whatever. That's killing our trees, our street trees and our neighbourhood big trees take a long time to die. The trees that are being cleared in your suburbs or your cities now because they are dangerous because they're dying, they died from heat stress 10 to 5 years ago and they're only being cut down now. But this is what the effect of our urban environment is and which is why I'm so passionate about what we're talking about today. Uh, can sure. I just interject one term there? I want to interject I want to tell people about the term the pension in a tree. So if a tree, let's just say a tree's there and you cut a bit out um, of the soil there to put a driveway in or something like that, and the tree looks fine for three, five, ten years, it's actually not fine. What you've done is you've actually robbed all of this energy for, that's stored in the tree's tissues, in its xylem, uh, in its phloem, in its sugar tissues. And um, so not only that, but you've also reduced the plant's ability to uptake nutrients with um, the removal of those, those roots. So let's say that the tree's living off its pension, which is the all the sugar stored in its system for 10 years, and then it just runs out of energy and then it dies. So you're right, you killed the tree 10 years ago, but now we're just seeing the signs of it finally yeah. spent all its pension and now it's going to die. And managers of the urban environment, which if you are a homeowner or a landowner, mm. that's you as well as your parks and gardens crew, as well as your horticultural manager at the botanic gardens all the you've all got the same kind of issues to deal with and the same responsibilities it's just that we notice them and we think that the cause was yesterday but no a lot of these problems that well i'm framing them as problems are 20 and 30 years old and the time to correct them is yesterday but the next best time is today that Water infiltration also has effects on your paving, your foundations, your footpath, your roads. So try if you can. If you do not need the beautiful, flat, even paving, if you can, remove every second paver so that water can infiltrate. Or if you're starting from designing from scratch, don't do that really radical hard paving because, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> it's bad in so many ways. Tree And tree roots can't grow under compacted six inches of compacted gravel, Lilydale toppings, anything like that. Even if it's reconstituted, it's a friendly road base and all that kind of stuff, recycled, reused. Plant roots don't dig it. They won't go. They won't go near it. And then that, that's when they'll start pushing over your neighbour's paving. And that's it. So yeah, they go for the easiest route possible. So they follow the gradient of the soil. So if if it's too hot, like it's not gonna. It's just like a pot. The roots are gonna hit a concrete base and then repel off. If it's all um, compacted, same thing. They can't grow through that. They want nice, friable soil. Now, let me say something about fences. This is my hobby horse <laughs> in the urban environment. We're talking about other animals. Possums love to run along the tops of fences. So do cats. But just imagine you live on the fringe of a city and you're lucky enough to have koalas. And the koala comes in because you've got a lovely food tree and he climbs up and he's up the top of the eucalyptus globulus or whatever he's, he's in. But to get to the next food tree, he's got to climb down. He can't jump across to an adjoining tree with that crossover of the canopy that I was talking about before. But you've got a six-foot-high paling fence in the way. There's nowhere for him to get through. And you've got dogs and your neighbour's got dogs. Basically, you're not going to have any koalas and your neighbourhood's not going to have any koalas, even if they're nearby and they would come in if they could. 
So we have to think about access for animals. We have to think about little holes in fences for lizards, for skinks, for spiders, for frogs, for all everything. Anyone want to add anything about fences? That's fences as barriers, not not, <laughs> not fences as structures. Fences as mm. barriers and opportunities to use them. Guys, you probably know the answer to this question. Are birds afraid of the smell of dogs and cats or is it just the noises or what's the go there? It's a bit of both. Mm. So they definitely pick up on the threat and they will know that there are dogs and or cats around. It's probably a more visual thing for most birds than smell, but potentially having an area of your yard if you have dogs that is off limits to the dog. Maybe you're using some sort of some sort of fencing that birds can move through that might block off a bit of the garden. And, of course, having the dog might be spending a lot of time inside. If you've got a cat, keeping it inside or in a contained run is absolutely the best thing, not only for wildlife, but for the cats as well. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. We, we can and, talk that if you want to. And, and you picked up on the on, on the thing I really wanted to get across, Holly, was that you can have barriers mm. that are able to be penetrated by birds and wildlife that are impenetrable for the things that you want to exclude. Mm. And that is where your planning needs mm. to happen before you've gone down to Bunnings or Mitre 10 or wherever and just bought a solid material because that's what you've been presented with. Please, when you are thinking about implementing barriers, that you think about what the purpose of it is but what the negative connotations, the negative effect on the other users of your space who are non-humans could be. Totally. Well, those fences, that's like in nature too. We have these fences, which are plants, bar- natural barriers, rocks and stuff like that. If you think about like a really spiky bush, that's basically like a barbed wire fence that bird, little tiny prey birds, maybe they're also predators, um, predate on insects and lizards and stuff, but these birds can jump into that barbed wire a, a thorny bush and they just love it because nothing wants to touch them in there. It's just too dangerous for them. So, yeah, definitely go thorny bushes, guys, if you're looking for habitat. But I will say on the topic of thorny bushes, and this comes back to planning, think really carefully about the best place for them right. because they are amazing for birds, little like hachia sericeas and prickly moses, wattles, fabulous for little birds. They're great to hide in. But if you are going to brush yourself past it every time you're going to hang the washing on the line, you are going to hate that plant very quickly. (laughs) So that comes back to planning where you are putting things and the best places for those prickly things to go. Great point, Harry. Now, we're going to run out of time if I don't move on to what my next talking point, my next important feature of a garden for wildlife for birds is we've talked about layers, we've talked about shelter, we've talked about access, traffic, providing water. Who's well, be going careful on in Queensland? <laughs> be careful anywhere tropical because if you leave that water in the dish, it's just going to create, create habitat for mozzies. So, yeah, well, empty out every day. Okay, let, let, Sorry. Holly, before, <laughs> before you take this up and run with it, Holly, I'll put yep. a couple of principles. Water has to be fresh. It has to be cool and because mosquitoes can be a real issue, not only in Queensland, in North Queensland, but we have Ross River down here in Ross River fever down here. We have all sorts of bloodborne diseases that mosquitoes might be involved in. Water should be moving. Now, it doesn't mean you need a creek, but you can put something as simple as a little bubbler in any receptacle and you will take care of those kind of issues and if you are providing water it needs to be for little birds needs to be shallow or you need to do things like place pebbles gravel and whatnot in it the other thing holly is you need to make sure that it's a place where it doesn't open up the opportunities for predators for your kookaburras, for your butcher birds, for your even your 
shrike, grey shrike, thrush, apart from the birds of prey. So maybe ha try and have something overhanging, put it somewhere where the they're not visually apparent from above. Over to you, Dr. Parsons. I don't need to. You've just said it all. <laughs> so you're right, Grant. So water is a fabulous way to attract birds to your garden and I can with 95% certainty say if you put a bird bath in, you will get birds using it. But there are those things that you need to be careful of. So making sure that the water is clean and fresh because birds are – bathing in it and drinking in it and it can get pretty disgusting pretty quickly we don't want to be spreading disease amongst a bird population that are all coming yes. in to use that water beacon or other wildlife that are coming is, in. beacon feather disease is very prominent in our yes. cockatoos and our rosellas our lorikeets of course there is an episode of the bird emergency with dr johanna martins about that Holly, so sorry go will Birds regularly visit places where there are no access, where there is no access to water. It depends on the bird. Yes, because birds are not only coming to your garden just for water. It will depend which of the items on their list that you can tick off for them. So water is a really great way to get them there. But if you have great shelter, if you have really good food resources, if it's a great insect life or you've got some great flowering plants, then they will still visit you. Absolutely, because they are searching around your neighbourhood to meet up all those resources. But if you're, you've got water, if it's nice and fresh, making sure you can either aerate it, as you said, or tip it out quite easily onto the garden and fill it back up again. You shouldn't need to use any chemicals and things if, it's, if you're replacing it daily or every second day. But thinking about really carefully about where you put your bath as well. If you've got a pedestal bath, you go down to the local hardware shop, there tends to be the ones that, you've, that you can get. If you've got a pedestal and it's out in the middle of your garden and there is nothing around it, then you are going to have rainbow lorikeets and magpies and things coming and using it, but you're not going to be helping the little guys that are shyer, that, that want to feel safe in order to use a bird bath. So if you put that or even if you don't have any dogs and cats and things in the yard, a plant saucer, on the ground? That's as simple as you need to go. And you can just scrape out, you can just scrape out a couple of inches, three, four centimetre depression, throw some plastic in it and then throw some gravel over the plastic and put some mulch around the edge of it. As long as that water is regularly there, that's all you need. Absolutely. I put in a pond and it was just a, a kitty wading pool that we weren't using anymore. Yeah. Dug it out, put it in, mulched around the outside. It's amazing. Was it um, one of those beautiful hard, hard, half shells? Uh, it was not. It wasn't no. a, little, no, <laughs> a little mermaid statue on the side or something. No. <laughs> but if you're putting that, um, you want to make sure if you're wanting to attract smaller birds and, and the, those shyer species, you want to make sure that it's not smack bang in the middle of shrubs because you don't want them to be attacked by a cat that's just going to dart out and grab them when they're bathing because it's a very vulnerable state for but birds. But, Holly, that would never happen because all the responsible owners in the area would have their cat contained. Exactly, exactly. So you're going to want just a little bit of distance from the shrubs. It doesn't have to be much, but where there is an escape route. And so if you get the opportunity to watch birds as they're bathing. It's not as creepy as it sounds. You will see that they will start, they'll, they'll have like one might be a little bit of a lookout and will sit on a branch and make sure everything is safe while the others splash around. Or if they are coming in by themselves, they'll dart in and out really quickly and they'll be looking around. They need an escape route. So they need a branch that they can fly up too quickly. They need a dense shrub the way they can make a getaway if something comes along and disturbs them. Now, just before we move on, here's someone from Facebook who I don't think we've had any contact with on Twitter. Hello, Naomi. Thanks for joining us. I have a small pond, concrete in the ground. How do I keep it clean? Ooh, if it's, and I know Naomi. Naomi's from our Birds in Backyards Facebook group. So if we, if you've got a pond in the ground and you've got the water cycling and if you've got all the plant, if you've got plants and things in there keeping it healthy, Dan, you might talk 
be able to talk to this, then you probably won't need to do a lot of cleaning out because the water is going to be cycling through and keeping things relatively healthy. If you need to do some cleaning out, you'd be getting the water out and then you could use like a really dilute bleach solution, like one to 20 or more and give it a real scrub, give it a really good rinse and let the sun get on it for a long time before you fill it back up again. That's another option for getting rid of any nasties before you maybe start refilling again, putting some now, plants in it. Dan, I'm sure you have a suggestion. After we've heard yours, I also have a good solution for this. So for plants, yeah, look, there are – don't put a plant that's not – hasn't evolved in a wetland environment. We're looking for plants that are going to thrive with wet feet. So I can't remember what it's called. There's a type of – it's not a mat rush. It's like a reed. So you can get like reeds. Um, have a check at your local nursery. That's the one. Cypress yeah, or great run. Just have a check run. at your local nursery. Yep. They'll know, especially if it's a native um, nursery and they do habitat and stuff like that. Now, Naomi, if you're still listening or still watching and you've got a particular problem – because when you say keep it clean, if you've got algae and things like that, there is a different solution. If it's having that horrible little floating azolla or whatnot which takes over the top of it, that's a, a different problem. But a small pond, the best way to restio tetraphyllus, thank you very much, that's another suggestion that's just come in. That is a corker for southern Australia and Eastern Australia. Sorry, Naomi, you you need to have a balanced environment in your pond. So those ribbon, ribbony kind of aquatic plants are important and you can pick them up from most nurseries nowadays. And you need to have a proportion of shade cover on the top of your pond so that you don't get too much because sunlight is energy and if you're getting runoff into your water with nutrients, that will just cause the algae and the slime to go absolutely crazy. Also, if you have things like lilies, and you can get native lilies as well as the larger, more extravagant water lilies, that will keep the temperature in the water constant and cool, which means a lot of these problems don't happen. But you can also have a nice environment, get some little fish, not big fish, little fish, and encourage, put in a couple of sticks and things like that so that you'll get other insects, you know, dandy, what do we call dragonfly, mayfly, larva, things like that. But you also want snails. If you've got water snails, that will eat the slime off the edges of your pond. So if your pond is always getting dirty, unclean it's not healthy so you need to actually insert life to the pond and think about those kind of things water is just like the built environment we've been talking about it needs shade it needs movement you don't want to over fertilize it so have a good look at your pond yeah Talking about over fertilizing, you're talking about shade over the top. Be careful of those leaves dropping in because that's going to turn into tea and then it's going to turn into mm-hmm. toxic kombucha because they're going to rot, they're going to yep. ferment. Yep. So, yep, get oxygen in there. Plants, get plants, mm-hmm. snails, get oxygen in that water. So, we've got aerobic activity, not anaerobic activity. I like a comment like this. Thank you. Great information. I'll definitely be using those <laughs> tips. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for. <laughs> and thank, thanks for taking part, Naomi, because it's uh, much more valuable if we can talk about issues people have rather than my favourite hobby horse. <laughs> so as we come along, now, is there anything that, that you guys want to add about water before I throw to our next or my next topic? I don't. No, I think we've covered the, the major bases. Okay, bird baths we'll get to in the next, not the next one, the one after. <laughs> food and this is natural food Love feeding opportunities one. but also feeding feeding <laughs> our wild birds so can i start that off who, guys i can i can yeah, see you go for it, sh- <laughs> can see you shuddering there when we're talking about feeding so holly do birds in their natural environment eat stir fry strips from coals or not that i'm aware of no <laughs> uh, so well not in the natural environment Apparently, Dan, in my local park, 
our neighbours think that whatever we had for dinner last night mm. and you go and throw it in the garden bed at the park, that's good for the birds, right? Mm. Spaghetti, bread. Yeah, soup. spaghetti is a, is the big one. Uh, <laughs> Two-minute noodles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. No, yes, predatory to... birds are eating whole foods, just like us. We like whole foods, right? So they're eating lizards with the gizzards, the lungs, skin, toenails, everything. They might throw up a bit of, um, you might see hair in their poop because they can't digest that or whatever. But the, it's whole foods. We're not looking for, yeah, they're not going down to Coles and buying stir fry strips. So let's think about feeding all different types of birds. We've got nectivorous birds that love nectar. So we're talking about big tubular flowers, especially if they're red, because apparently birds can see red really well. These are things like your calistamons, your proteaceae members, like myrtaceae members, like calistamons, basically big flowers that you see nectar birds shoving their beaks in and, and sucking the juices out. Then you've also Dan, got, go, mate. Just want to in interject just one thing. Yeah. The most popular grevillea I had growing in both the nursery that I had and my home that adjoined a state park was Grevillea cherisei, which has green and dark flowers, nothing to look at, but the birds went mental over it. Shade-loving Grevillea as well. So it's one of those good ones for a difficult position. Temperate, temperate Australia right up to subtropical Australia. Mm. Take it away, well, Mr. It's a bit Fuller. Different. Well, it's a bit different. So you've got your um, Grevillea Robin Gordons. So, like, everyone loves them. And it's a great plant. It's beautiful. But Dr. John Martin in our episode, I can't remember if it was 27 or 28, he mentions, like, these are sugar buffets. They don't really exist in nature. They've mm. been cultivated and bred for human values. So it's like, yeah, of course we want to look at beautiful Robin Gordon flowers, beautiful Grevillea Robin Gordon flowers every day of our lives. And the birds want to suckle the sugar out of it, but it's not necessarily the best for them. In nature, you'll find one plant is flowering, another one is throwing out seeds, and then at another part of the season, it's just like not doing anything. It's just habitats. Yeah, and think about all the different types of foods you can provide. We're thinking about nectar flowers for birds. We're thinking about dead wood to create spaces for grubs and stuff like that for predatory birds. Then we're also thinking about seeds and stuff like that. So the wider variety you have of different opportunities for these birds to graze on, the better off you're going to be. And let's try and get them as close to nature as possible. Let's go locally endemic plants where we can, even if they're not, they don't flower for as long as the Grevillea Robin Gordon. That's great. This is what birds actually need. Holly, yeah. feeding, feeding birds. I guess on the, the Grevilleas, the hybrid Grevilleas and the Robin Gordons and things, absolutely beautiful looking plants, like Dan said, don't really replicate what goes on naturally. And so I'd particularly emphasize if you've got noisy miners, so the native honey eater, if you've got rainbow lorikeets around, I would suggest not putting in nectar producing plants because that will just suck those guys in. They are bullies and they will not give any other things a chance to come and visit your garden. So Instead of going for those rich, hybrid, rich nectar producing things, go for smaller flowering grevilleas. We've talked about some of them today. They're beautiful. I, I think it's, I actually think it's more that people don't get exposed to what mm. a lot of these plants look like. So they don't know they're out there mm. to choose them. There's another reason why, too, and that is if you go to your local nursery, of which there are very few nowadays, mm. that's what's in stock. Mm. Yes. That's so, so if, if you don't know if you don't but, know what's but, out there, you, yeah. if you can't get a hold of it, it makes it hard to put it in the ground. But before yeah. we finish up, we'll talk more about plant availability and selection. But Holly, where, where I was going from, feel free to criticise me mm -hmm. for my disgusting base human habit. I regularly go across to the park and broadcast a wild bird mix mm -hmm. and encourage the birds that are here. I I know that a lot of people say you should not feed wild birds mm -hmm. and I'm going to also mention a few things that I think you should not do. But in my defence as a as a bird feeding criminal, mm -hmm. I don't put it out I don't put it out every day. Mm -hmm. I don't put it out in the same spot and I don't put it out in the same density. 
so that the birds, be they introduced birds or the native birds, can't form the habit that breakfast or lunch is going to be there regularly all the time. They must go and forage elsewhere. So bird feeding could be a whole other podcast. Well, maybe it will be, guys. (laughs) Yep. So uh, you're right. We know that we tend to feed the birds that are doing really well anyway. And by feeding, I mean intentionally going and putting out seed, meat, yes. yep. nectar mixes, In- fruit. Um, interventionist, opportunist, yep. uh, opportunistic feeding that would not be available on plants, by plants yes. or other things like like beetles and bugs. And, and then if yep. you move away, you're not feeding anymore and that disrupts that, the whole thing too. Yeah, that's so, that's the key point about not doing it regularly all the time the same way. Birds will in, depend on it. That's a bit of a myth, actually. Interestingly, Ooh. there's actually not a lot of evidence that birds become dependent on people, despite mm. the puppy dog eyes they may give, and sometimes if it's the cockatoos and things, the destructive behaviour that might happen afterwards. Um, Birds don't tend to become dependent on us for food. They will still go and forage naturally. They won't starve if you stop feeding them, but we don't want to get to that point. So it's about if you are going to feed birds, in an urban environment there's really no need to. It's more something for us, but that connection to nature is really important and and I'm not disputing that. That's why I've got a funny story too at the end here. Okay, so (laughs) establishing that connection to nature is great. We need people to care and feeding birds is one way that that people can care, but we want to make sure we do it responsibly. So if you are going to do it, it's about doing it infrequently. So it's not something that where you get 50 cockatoos showing up expecting their breakfast because it becomes a problem for your neighbours as well. It it then can create some animosity there. That you're feeding appropriate foods, so you are not feeding sugar and water. If avoiding mints is really sticky, yeah. and again, that whole it's not a whole food. So, if you are going to do some stir fry strips, coat it in some calcium powder or something, so that it's a little bit more nutritious. Alternatively, dog food is is one of the better options for meat eaters. But thinking now, about the I consequences of eating eating meat, but yes, go for it. Sorry, Holly. I- I had a beautiful suggestion from Dr. Claire Greenwell, who listeners to my show will know as Australia's fairy turn expert. When we were talking about this in on Twitter a month or two back, we uh, we will we talked about feeding magpies and butcher birds and things like that. I suggested mealworms, growing mealworms and things like that as a former child horticulturist. Um, Claire said bloodworms, and I researched it. They're commercially available. Claire gave me a link, and I'm happy to share that out with anyone who contacts me and asks for it. But bloodworms have all those kind of things, Dan, skeletons, exoskeletons, gizzards, all the good stuff that they're eating. So they're a whole food for birds like magpies and butcher birds, currawongs and whatnot that will come in. Even blackbirds, grey shrike, thrush, the mm. black-faced cuckoo shrikes, kookaburras, all those kind of things. Sorry for introducing, interrupting Holly, but I thought that we would never get back here and I wanted <laughs> to give people the opportunity to chase me up for that because that was a great suggestion from Claire. Solves all of the problems of providing protein to those insectivorous and carnivorous birds that visit us. So thanks, Claire. That's a great one. That's a great one. I've thought about mealworms and things before. Apparently mealworms are not particularly enticing, which is really surprising. I know my chickens go nuts when they get put out, but bloodworms is a really great one. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I mean, try and get a quail or a duck to give up a mealworm. But no, that's what Claire was telling me. And look, hey, she's like you, Holly. She's a doctor and she's a good bird well, doctor. Who am I to? <laughs> so back to the feeding. So it's it's feeding infrequently. It's feeding appropriate food. So no bread, no sugar and water mix, making sure that you're paying attention to what you're feeding. So if you are starting to attract 
large numbers of birds, if you've got those 50 cockatoos coming to visit you, too many. it might be time to hold back a little bit. Yeah, too many. And really importantly, you need to make sure you are impeccably clean. So if you are using any sort of feeding tray, that it is as soon as you finish, it is scrubbed down, it is cleaned, it is allowed to dry in the sun, you are you are not spreading disease because beak and feather in particular is something that that gets spread through feeders really easily and it's a really unpleasant thing to witness amongst a cockatoo population. And so we want to make sure that we are impeccably clean when, when we're doing this. It might seem like a really easy thing to do for wildlife because you just go and buy your packet of seed or whatever and you put it out and you've done your bit. But you can do a lot of harm if you don't do it responsibly. So Having said that, as I said before, it is a really nice way to feel connected with your local bird life. And that connection to nature is critical if we are going to save these things. Mm -hmm. If we want to save a little brown bird in the middle of nowhere that is threatened with extinction, a big part of that will get be getting people to connect with what they've got in their garden. And so if that's sulfur crested cockatoos, that's what we do. At the risk Sorry. of at the risk of upsetting anyone with their tender feelings, we need to make people give a shit, actually give an actual shit about birds um, and frogs and newts. Oh, we don't have newts much in Australia, but uh, fish and yabbies and frogs and uh, rabbits and no, no, not rabbits. I was thinking (laughs) soft The word I was trying to think of was lizards and Things like that. It, we, Skinks, geckos. You know, we need We've got native geckos yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Dan, tell us your funny story before I run off in, onto another tangent. Yeah. I'm glad I got to get this one in. So my family, when we were growing up f- for a period of time anyway, we lived, we backed onto a, a footy oval and we used to feed the feed the magpies just, yeah, stir fry strips. We didn't know any better back then. So, yeah, just feeding them stir fry strips, thought that was all good. But when my brother played footy at school on the oval, all the magpies were sweeping all his friends, but they didn't attack him because they were the same yeah. ones that he'd been feeding. Yeah. So, they, yeah, they, they they have a great memory and they really do recognise you. Absolutely. Oh, Holly, that, that's, a, that's a whole nother podcast about how magpies actually recognise the good people yeah. and the bad people. <laughs> I don't get swooped in here. We have a family in the park who... I oh, know I've been here five or six breeding seasons now. I don't get swooped. All of my male neighbours do, or all, all the old men do, because they're out there throwing rocks at them and chasing them off their lawn and whatnot. They know who you are and they get you. And you can Feeding. get to learn who they are too. Like you might Absolutely. say, this one's daddy, this one's mummy, and this one's the baby. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, I, I just wanted to throw in, Holly, that if people don't, if they want to feed the beautiful nectar-feeding birds, Mm -hmm. sugar and water is bad. Mm -hmm. Honey and water in those old bottle feeders are bad because that can go fermenting. But there are products out there that you can buy that are specially formulated for nectar-feeding birds. Do Do you suggest people seek them out and use them? Over any of those other options? Absolutely. So, yeah, you can get them at your pet supply store. They're available as like a dry mix or a wet mix. But, again, especially if it's a wet mix, it can turn nasty very quickly, um, especially if you're feeding in summer. So make sure that you any food you're putting out, regardless of what it is, it's not available for a long period of time. Yeah. So it's it doesn't have the opportunity to spoil and cause problems that way. So, I mean, I like to think of it as a as a treat. So it's a treat for, for you putting out the food and interacting with the birds and it's a treat for the birds. It's a special mm-hmm. little something that's not, you know, they're the main component of their diet. It, it's relatively healthy and so then it's not something that's going to cause problems for them down the track. It's an after-dinner mint. So what are some of the bad things that happen when birds are eating the wrong things? What can happen to them? So you can get some pretty nasty diseases. So there's metabolic 
bone disease is a particular nasty one that magpies and things can get, particularly if they're being fed things that are calcium deficient. I know I, I've had lots of comments from people who do a lot of wildlife rescue saying that they will get an influx of young birds at, towards the end of spring where mum and dad may have been eating or bringing in mints and things to them. So the young birds are right, might be getting that fed to them. They take some first flights. They don't have all the calcium to develop strong, healthy bones. So when they take a tumble, as they invariably do, they break a wing or something and there's very little chance of recovery from that. Um, so we want to make sure that we're giving some nice holistic food that isn't going to result in those injuries. The other thing, the issue with things like mints is not only that it's deficient in a lot of calcium and other vitamins, is that it's goopy. It gets stuck. So it can get stuck in a magpie or in a kookaburra beak and then it can cause problems, can get bacterial infections, it can rot. You can sometimes see magpies and things that have got broken bits to their beaks and it makes it really hard for them to forage properly. So there's a lot that can go wrong, unfortunately. And and it's much better if the magpie is strolling around your garden or your park or your neighbourhood eating grubs in the soil from the soil and crickets and little skinks and things like that way before they're rocking up to your your back door, your porch, and taking a lump of cheese out of your hand. Mm -hmm. And they'll love you just as much if you're digging up some lawn grubs and throwing them to them than if you're putting out some mints. On that point, Holly, I believe that it's been proven that no matter what you do, the bird doesn't love you. You're just a a thing that gives them access to food. That's right. You're... You're no more important than a bird bath or a, <laughs> a, a street sign that they can sit on and survey their their world. You're just a thing. Yes. I think we have a tendency to anthropomorphise our birds, absolutely. And so you're right. You are the vehicle that is giving them something that they need to tick off that little resource list that they have. So it gives you a buzz. It gives them a buzz too, but it's a very different kind <laughs> kind of appreciation. Like a free meal to buzz, not like a... <laughs> you're no more important than the fifth free coffee that you get at your local <laughs> cafe. That's all you are. Uh, That's okay, though. Everybody loves a free coffee. Right, that's right. I'm not complaining about it. I'm just saying don't <laughs> confuse it with love. It's not right. love. But yeah. it is. it gives us a good sense of um, accomplishment and that connection, mm. which is good for the birds because they're getting those resources that they need and it's keeping them happy. But it's good for us too. Connection mm. with nature is good for us in conservation to conserve things that – people are maybe quite disconnected from because it gets people involved, it gets funding, it gets people taking action. But it's important for individuals as well. And there's great research now coming out about how that connection with nature, getting out in the garden or in the urban environment or in the local park has huge benefits for our mental health, for our physical health. We can be selfish by creating a bird-friendly garden for them. And I just want to clarify, I love birds, I love plants, but they don't love me. <laughs> all right. Now. It can I, be a bit one watch- We can love them. I, I, I'm watching the time and I'm uh, mindful of how long we've been going with useful information, Holly and Dan and droning on from me. But I, I want to I, I put you both on the spot. I want to leave plant selection because that's a massive topic yeah. mm-hmm. and perhaps uh, bordering on design issues. I want to leave that for the next time we do that, and I'm certainly going to be doing it again. Hopefully you're both going to join me. The last thing that I want to put on the agenda for today is the issue of shelter and if we can talk about shelter for protection. We've talked about temperature a bit briefly, but then we've got things like roosting and we've got breeding. And, Dan, you can go for your life on hollows here. Yeah. Holly, what are the kinds of shelter that different kinds of birds need and will use in our backyards? Oof, big question. Again, it depends on the bird as to what sort of place in the garden they want to be. So for something like your little fairy wrens, 
They are foraging out on the grass for food. That's where they are doing their, their hunting of insects is out on open space. But that shelter is a shrub. So it is a shrub layer that they are going to that is nice and dense and where they can hide. A lot of other birds, particularly bigger birds, are needing the shelter of a tree canopy. It's cooler. It keeps them protection from anything overhead. It gets them up off the ground and away from predators. And so we know from some, from things like our birds in backyard surveys where we look at those habitat features is that some birds, interestingly, like it was magpie larks, yellowtail black cockatoos and king parrots either liked gardens with lots of lawn and next to no trees or almost no lawn and lots of tree cover. Mm. And that's because in the case of all that tree cover, that's the roosting environment that they're looking for. They're coming down mm. into gardens that have got open lawn space to feed and then nicking off into the tall branches to get a mm. bit of um, shelter and a, and a bit of time to sit digest, chat with the rest of their flock. Reinforce, the reinforce their social bonds. Exactly. Yeah. And Holly, a lot about fairy wrens. When I interviewed Atore for my podcast yes. and we talked about the complex social nature of fairy wrens, I found out they all roost together. So they actually need like a long, comparatively long branch where a dozen or 20 of them can actually all huddle up together at night. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I didn't realise. I thought they maybe would utilise an old nest or something like that, but they don't. They need that, they need that open branch, but it's got to be protected. So it's got to be in a shelter belt or a un, some dense shrubs. Our favourite, Dan, the hydrangea, something like that. You know, something yeah, dense and impenetrable <laughs> from the outside. Holly, what what about things that where do, where do things like lorikeets and cockatoos roost? So lorikeets, cockatoos, a big again, it's that big flock. So you'll often find that multiple flocks will come together to a single or multiple trees at night. For rainbow lorikeets in particular, I believe they're, they're often attracted to locations where there's lots of artificial light at night. So you'll get them around train stations, mm -hmm. at least in my neighbourhood. That's where they yep. tend to come together to uh, roost at night. Northwest Island pines. On, yep. Uh, I've seen them in northern Australia just stripping those things, the areas, stripping them of all the foliage. And starlings do it too. Oh, yes. Come in and... Yep. Yeah, in common miners as well. They all come in from all over multiple suburbs. They all converge to a few roost trees and that's where they hang out for the night and that's where they probably pass messages as to where the good food mm -hmm. was, as to where different resources are available. They all come together because there's safety in numbers at night and then it's very noisy and can be very messy and mm -hmm. then the next day they all go their separate ways again. Dan, tree hollows. 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 <laughs> yes, very important. So in Australia we don't have woodpeckers. In other continents we have a woodpecker that makes a hollow. In Australia, basically a lot of our, most of our tree hollows are created through fungal rot. So you'll have a branch that dies over long periods of time. It rots down. And it's funny how a branch connects to a tree. It's basically like one branch is connected to another to the mother branch, basically not very well at all. Like it's amazing how trees can actually keep the branches in. It has a, a shoulder there. It's called a branch collar and branch, branch bark ridge, <laughs> all of that. Yeah. Branch collar. So it's attached in. And then when this branch here rots out, it'll fall out. And then where it connects in, it'll basically rot into the tree and create a hollow. Yeah. So you'll get cockatoos coming in and pulling out the, the rotten bits to make that hollow bigger. And so, yeah, these hollows take a really long time to, to make in nature. Like they say around about 100 years, even though that can vary a lot on the circumstances, the species of the tree, what sort of damage it's been under, et cetera. So obviously if a tree has been attacked by lightning 10 years ago, that's really going to fast track how much habitat that tree can have. Yeah, but in horticulture, the advice is generally to go around and cut out any of the dead wood. You don't want dead wood because it rots into the tree. Yeah, 100% true. It is going to damage that tree. 
but that damage is what creates habitat for mm. for these yeah ne tree nesting birds and other things so whether it's just a a tiny little five cent piece opening of a hole or whether it's a giant thing that a human being can step inside of down the bottom of the uh, just on the trunk of the tree all of these different sized habitats are really important for plants mm. uh, for, for, for habitat and <laughs> They're not important for, for plants. They're not good for plants. <laughs> no, for insects, for mammals, for birds, for all the little invertebrates and whatnot, and they, of course, provide food. Now, we we, we can probably talk about hollows as a whole separate session. <laughs> I've got my next episode of The Bird Emergency is about lyrebirds and the Albert lyrebird, but... After that, I have a two-part series where we're talking with Mick Callan from Habitat Habitat oh, Australia cool. about his recent work and their fantastic, fantastic work on hollows. So don't miss that. And then following that up with Leanne Woolley and her work on Gouldian finches who are very, very picky about what kind of hollow will constitute a breeding opportunity for them. And, of course, Leanne is with WWF in northern Western Australia. She knows what she's talking about. Uh, yeah. well, I'll be tuning into that one. That'll be excellent. Before we wrap up, we've can got... Can I just say two got, more things before we wrap up? <laughs> mate, you can Thank say you. a lot of things. I just want to say to the people <laughs> who are watching, because we do have eyeballs, um, watching us, which is great, and thanks for sticking with us all the way. If there's anything you want to ask now is the opportunity to whack it in the comments and we'll get up onto it before we before we do wrap this up. And, Dan, you've got an opportunity in a second. But let's just talk about some of the places that people can get information and can source appropriate plants and perhaps foods and things like that. Holly, is there anywhere you want to particularly point out? Look, I'll give a plug to the Birds in Backyards website as a kind of a, a bit of a place where people can go to get some overarching info on tips and tricks for creating great habitat. So that's birdsinbackyards.net. You can also join in and do some citizen science surveys and things with us. It's all on there. For specific local information, I would always encourage people to check out what their local council has got going on. So go to your local council website. There will be an environment section. Some of them are amazing. Some of them maybe not so much. They will let you know where there are some locally native nurseries around you because that's a great source. We didn't really talk about it today of locally native plants, of often cheaper plants to put in the ground because if you're wanting mm. to create a bird-friendly garden, you're usually going to need a lot of plants and it can get expensive. <laughs> So anywhere you can get some cheaper plants is great and the added bonus being they're going to be great for wildlife as well. So check out your local council and see what programs they're offering as well. So sometimes they will have mm. um, programs that are specifically about coming to your garden and giving you some advice. It might be where your nursery is. My local council at the moment is running a street tree program where I can actually and have done requested a street tree, got to pick one that is perfectly positioned and the exact right type that I want that is also going to attract wildlife and not grow to a height, which is going to be an issue. So that's a great initiative that's being run um, through my council. Lots of councils will have similar sort of things. So it's worth scoping out locally and seeing what's there. If there's nothing there, contact your council and say you want these sort of biodiversity programs. You want to go about creating habitat and you want to know that's an important issue for you because until we tell them that's something that we want, they may not provide it for us. So you need to make some noise and let them know. Yeah, look, all three of us here today in this chat have got some great resources. So obviously I'm going to be pointing people to the Bird Emergency Podcast. Check that out. I'm also going to be sending people to BirdLife Australia, the website there. Make sure you guys are checking that out. Also check out the Plants Grow Here website. We focus a lot more on gardening, but ecology is a huge part of what we do. Yeah, you're going to learn about plants on here. We've got a couple of episodes that I particularly point you to, which was 27 hab Trees as Habitat and also 28 Wildlife Assist and also episode 3 Native Gardening. A lot of that information has been talked about in here, but you're, yeah, you'll get a lot more as well. I also mentioned at the start... John Dengate's book, Attracting Birds to Your Garden in Australia. So that'll keep you guys busy. So yeah. that should uh, now, keep you, yeah, quite busy. 
We were talking about, we've just got another another message in here, which I'll just put up on the screen. Uh, these days I struggle to get good tube stock, things like Hakea nodosa or Tasmanian species. Now that's a perfect segue to what I was just about to say. Because I did once run a a nursery that was basically all about native wildlife habitat and indige stuff. And in a previous life, I was also a land care coordinator for a regional area. I have in the bowels of my computers, I think it's actually in my Google Drive, a lot of these contacts. And I also have a timetable of things like banksias and grevilleas and malalukas and callistamins that flower all year and seed-bearing plants that flower all year. So you can actually have a calendar of opportunity for your garden. Now, I'm happy to provide those to anyone. The way to get it is to email me, grant at thebirdemergency.com, or if you're not an email person but you're a Twitter person, at bird emergency, follow me. I generally follow back. If I if I don't, give me a nudge, and DM me. Give me your details, and I'll make those things available to you. I've got to be honest. I've got forty episodes of the bird emergency to get done on the website, which is happening this week. So I won't get PDFs up on the website for that yet, but they will be coming. Have the you considered other putting thing, an RSS feed? You can just get, you can just pull. Yeah, you can I, get a little I, player and pull. It yeah, easy, I, easy I, I, no, I've got my episodes on there. No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, look, I don't want to make it all about me, but it's all about me at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that 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 that's enough about me. What do you think about yeah. me? I think isn't that the line? <laughs> my website. I run out of time to get things done, but I'm going through now, just putting all the links. Not only do I put the episodes up, but for the people who have moved on, the guests who are now doing other things, I'm updating and putting their publications in and all that. That all takes time so that you will get more than listening to the podcast on on the site which Ooh. because it's all about helping people find other people. That's what it's all about. What I would say is, oh, look, we've got another great comment before I get in here. This is useful. Flowering gardening is Mount Annan's. Oh, yeah, Dr. Judy McLeod's fragrant native gardens. That's a beauty. Let me add to that, actually, is Gwen Elliott with her all of her container gardening and small gardening books. You can still find them. So that's Gwen Elliott and Roger Elliott. If you search Roger Elliott, and actually I'll, on the I'll, when I eventually get this, page done i'll put all these up on there but don't forget your local land care groups your friends of like in melbourne we've got mary creek and then you've got all the little local grasslands and things like that but every area has friends of groups mm -hmm. field gnats look up the field naturalists there's so many places to get good information look it out and of course Get involved. Citizen science. Get involved. And one birds, last. naturalist. Yes. One last resource. If you are wanting to grow plants, Nindathana Seed Services, I think they are, just Nindathana, N-I-N-D-E-T-H-A-N-A. -E if you Google that, you'll find them. They're in Western Australia. They do mail order of small quantities and specific provenances and all those kind of things that we're talking about. In conjunction with my calendars for all the different kind of popular genera that I did, you can source plants very easily if you're only wanting to grow one, two, three or four. Any extras if you're doing seeds, give them to your neighbours. That's a great opportunity for them to just grow them, give them it. Give them something in a six-inch pot and say, here we are. Ah, yes, but some of us are totally crap at growing from seed. Yes, that's true. But you can reach out to people like Dan and I who know how to do it. So, yeah. A little bit. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. All right. We've had plenty of comments, only a couple of questions, but that hopefully will be different next time. 
thanks to everyone who's been watching and contributing. That makes it that makes us know that if we did more than two days promotion, we'll probably get <laughs> we'll probably get a lot more people. Can I spill the beans about like we I think we're agreed we're gonna do this again. Can I, I'll spill the beans about someone I'm really excited who has agreed to speak to us in the future. The most magnificent built landscape architect. No, he's not a landscape architect, landscape construction dude based in Melbourne, Philip Johnson. Go on Philip Johnson Landscapes and see what you can do with water in any kind of environment. Phil, we're going to work out a date, but we're going to talk to Phil. That's going to be amazing. Thanks, Dr. Holly There's so much more to talk about. (laughs) Oh, I know, right? No, thank you for having me. I had a blast. Time's flown. Birdlife.org.au if you can't remember anything else or Google Birds in Backyards. Thank you, Margaret. For Thank you all have enjoyed. Yes, we've enjoyed doing it. Thanks for thanks for finding your way here because we, look, we really did this. We did this in a hurry, a spur of the moment idea. I'm glad we did. Thanks, Tess. Join us next time, Tess, Margaret, SD Ruth. I don't know whether that's Ruth or whether it's Struth. Uh, Struth. We'll get to know you better. That was a large contributor to our Twitter conversation. Dan Fuller, host or co-host, but you're generally the host host. because because Ben's always pretty busy. Dan Fuller, Plants Grow Podcast. I can tell you. The the second truth. Oh, hang on, Ruth. I don't look, think, correct truth. me, Ruth. Uh, truth, 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 the truth. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks again, Naomi. That's uh, very. She's just said fabulous talk. Really enjoyed it. We enjoyed doing it. You can find me oh, so many places, but Twitter is where I tend to interact when I'm not actually recording podcasts. At Bird Emergency, hashtag Bird Twitter, hashtag Twitter Nature Community, hashtag Wild Oz. These are all great places to find kindred spirits. I'm Grant Williams. That's Dr. Holly Parsons. He's Thanks, everyone. Daniel Fuller. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, guys. And don't be afraid to muck it up either.